So good evening, everybody. Thank you all for being here for the second in our great nonfiction writers series lectures uh, tonight by Sandy Weisenberg. Um, Sandy began her uh, writing career at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, where she earned her MFA. Uh, she is now the co-director of the Masters in MFA program in creative writing at Northwestern University. She's also the author of the nonfiction book, The Adventures of Cancer Bitch, as well as the essay collection, Holocaust Girls, History, Memory, and Other Obsessions, and the short story collection, The Sweetheart is In. She has received a Pushcart Prize and awards and fellowships from the Illinois Arts Council at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. She was a feature writer at the Miami Herald and has taught at Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism. Her work has appeared in dozens of anthologies as well as magazines such as The New Yorker, Val Shares, Michigan Quarterly Review, and Creative Nonfiction Magazine. She is the Creative Nonfiction Editor of ACM, or another Chicago magazine. It is her exquisite blend of journalistic investigation with lyric eye that we want to honor tonight. She has said that journalism forced her out into the world, taught her how to master a subject quickly through deep research and interviews. But mostly she learned that before she could explain something, even from her own life, she had to investigate it like a journalist. In the face of horror, she is bold and wildly funny. She began her essay, Holocaust Girls, singing, I am a Holocaust girl, to the tune of the Wizard of Oz's Lollipop Guild. And of course, she titles her book, The Adventures of Cancer Bitch. I use her work in my classes to help my students push the boundaries of propriety and of genre. Tonight, she will tell us some of the ways and reasons she does what she does so well. Sandy?
Some of the I's are teachers, some are also writers or editors or publishers or talk show hosts, hosts or the Twittering masses. All around the country, graders are exchanging definitions and arguing over them and the parameters of the genre. And there's some overlap, but not complete overlap. My definition is factual writing that makes it clear to the reader what has been documented and what, if anything, is speculation. It's important to my sanity that I know what really happened, even if I'm receiving an admittedly subjective report. And CNF is creative in the way it is presented, the point of view, voice, choice of subject, mix of subjects, meaning, rhythm, structure, language, dialogue, and so on. What it is not is formulaic, unless the writer is using a fixed form, using a structure that goes against the subject matter so that the juxtaposition is funny or meaningful. For example, in The New Yorker, there was a guide to the author's bathroom using the format of a travel guidebook. My favorite piece of, I guess it's short fiction though, that plays with a fixed form is called My 57th Recommendation Letter This Week by David Gallup, which begins, to the admissions committee, I think. But this is not that. Two, and so to begin, Eduardo Galliano is a writer from, anybody know? Okay, Uruguay. He writes that he never liked history and that he's written books about history of South America anyway. In Voices in Time, he is very clipped. His writing is simple, profound, prose poem-like. He writes in Spanish and consults with an English translator. I've heard him read and speak in English. This is the first page of that book. The title is Time Tells. We are made of time. We are its feet and its voice. The feet of time walk in our shoes. Sooner or later, we all know, the winds of time will erase the tracks. Passage of nothing, steps of no one. The voices of time tell the voyage. And there's a similar, in a way, kind of a similar piece that comes next, and it's called Footprints. A couple was walking across the savanna in East Africa at the beginning of the rainy season. The woman and the man still looked a lot like apes, truth be told, though they were standing upright and had no tails. A nearby volcano, now called Sodoma, was belching ash. The rain of ash preserved the couple's footprints from that moment through time. Beneath their gray blanket, the tracks remained intact. These, those footprints show that this Eve and that Adam had been walking side by side. At a certain point, she stopped, turned away, and took a few steps on her own. Then she returned to the path they shared. The world's oldest footprints left traces of doubt. A few years have gone by, the doubt remains. So he is extrapolating. He sees the footprints maybe in a book or maybe on site, and he surmises what happened. There's a short narration. They're walking, there's the volcano, there are their tracks. The last paragraph is interpretive. Three, do you know the voice of Andre Kudrescu? Yes, no? Okay. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. See, I was afraid I would like knock someone out. So. Okay. Anyway, he was on public radio all the time. He's originally from Romania, and he lived in New Orleans, and maybe he's still there. This piece is from The Devil Never Sleeps and Other Essays. It begins with two phenomena. Two new establishments have opened in the neighborhood, both of them emblematic of a new status quo in America. The first sentence gives us a fact in the first clause and a leap at meaning in the second. There are two new establishments. They represent a new status quo. He builds tension. We read the next sentence or keep the radio on to hear the next sentence. What are the two new establishments? They are, he tells us, a cigar cafe, and he describes it throughout the rest of the paragraph. The second is a dog bakery. He describes it too. 
And he goes on in the last paragraph to combine the two in a fanciful way. The dog ladies are, it seems to me, the natural mates of the cigar chompers across the street. Their belief is that their dogs defend them from crime, but stylishly because the dogs, in addition to eating pastries, are pedigreed and come formally in every shape, from accordion pleats to taut mobs. The cigar smokers dream of an economy where such luxuries are affordable, and safety does indeed come in many shapes. Meanwhile, the band plays on, the dog catcher is on the run, the market is on the rise, and the heat means nada to the cool. It is not personal, personal except in the aside, it seems to me. And it's not the ending you would expect. It's not a traditional ending. He surmises what the dog ladies think and what the cigar smokers dream. And I think this is permissible because we know that he is surmising. And he takes us to an entirely new place at the end. Four, Louis Menand takes something that is in the news, something reported by NPR and the New York Times, and riffs on it in uh, the New Yorker comment section. The news is that there's a new ringtone that people over the age of 20 can't he hear. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We often say a piece of writing is expository as if it's a bad thing because everyone must show and not tell. This is true much of the time that the reason we like CNF so much is that we can express our thoughts, we can follow our thoughts, you can follow our thoughts by reading them. The journey is in the mind. Manon uses the new ringtone to explore the diminishment of faculties that we experience as we age. He begins. There is a new cell phone ringtone that can't be heard by most people over the age of 20, according to an NPR report. The importance of this, he writes further down, is it is that one more way for middle-aged people to feel that they're losing it has been discovered. <laughs> he ends self-consciously but effectively. This is part of his last paragraph. Readers who are over 20 may not hear the new ringtone. If they had it on their phones, it might as well be silent. But most readers who are under the age of 20 will not be able to hear this comment. Yes, they will see the words and they will imagine that they are reading something and that it makes sense, but they will never truly get it. Five, and here is your turn. How did you get here tonight? What did you bring with you? Did you come alone? How long has this lecture been in your date book or smartphone or written on your hand or on your bulletin board? Was it a casual decision to come or something you've been thinking about? Why did you come? Was it an assignment, uh, interest? Uh, I, once I read at a Catholic university and people got point, culture points for coming to hear so how did you do that here? Probably not. Um, was there a deeper wanting to become a writer, or to become a better writer, or to hear and see a writer that you've read? If you were just writing about yourself tonight, it would be easy. You wouldn't have to move. You don't even have to ask yourself because you know. But ask the people behind and in front of you and to the side these questions. I'm going to give you like two minutes and just ask people why they came and um, if they came by themselves and where they came from, etc. So people are kind of scattered, so you're going to have to improvise. Somebody. <laughs>
information. Okay, so can I have somebody say what they found out about someone? Yeah. Robert came from Rochambeau, which I can only assume is a restaurant, but I should have asked. No, it's a street. street. It's a street. Okay, so it's a city <laughs> in France. It, it was a general who helped us oh. push the British out. Oh, of oh thank you. We were forever grateful. And then you get <laughs> All right. This, the reason I asked you this is because it relates to what I'm going to read to you. Um, this is from the Colossus of New York and by Colson Whitehead. And he's observing the Port Authority. And he says, they're all broken somehow, sagging down the stairs of the bus. Otherwise, they would have come here differently. The paparazzi do not wait to take their picture. Barricades do not hold back the faithful. This is the back entrance after all. So he's drawing a conclusion. He's opining, he's judging. He, he lets us know what, what he thinks of these people without using the eye. And he's not objective. Um, and even from the second and third words, you hear they're all broken. He tells us what Port Authority is like by partly telling us what it is not like. And then he continues observing and extrapolating. In the parking berth, it is anticlimactic. A man in goggles records the time of arrival. The baggage handler huffs into his palms, one job closer to punching out. Thousands of arrivals every day, they won't stop coming. Different people, but all the same. They try to sneak by with different faces, but it is no use. They step down the grooved steps, clutching items, and the attendant lugs the bags out of the bin, looking for handles. They get excited and jostle. Is someone going to steal their bags? They have all heard the stories. One of them has a cousin who came here once and was a victim of street crime. He had to have the money wired so he could get home, and that was the last time their plan went to New York. There is a thing called Three Card Monty out to get you. They have all heard the stories, and they all come anyway. The bags thud on concrete and get taken. So, you know, he's got some general stuff. You know, they're all broken, and he's got the individual stories. And we can, we can think that he interviewed them. I don't know if he's just knows enough about Port Authority and people coming to New York that he's talked to enough people in his life that he can say these things. So. If you had to make general statements about tonight, like they come here for X, can somebody come up with a sentence? They come here for culture points. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And if it was a focus on individuals, <laughs> like one person. Yeah. To expand our knowledge of creative nonfiction. Yeah. Individual, yeah. yeah. Hi. So give yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. This is number six. Kudrescu's NPR piece was very short. Many magazines, including alumni magazines, published pieces at the back of the book. And I, I don't know if there's an equivalent online. I was trying to think of this. Maybe 800 words. This is from Book Magazine, which died. So in case you might not have heard of it. Um, and it's a, it was from the back of the book. I think it's about 800 words. And it's about a very, very small thing. It's about the stuff you find inside of old books. Has anybody ever found something inside of an old book or a library book? Like, what did you find? People slice. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> You knew their names? My best and stuff. I looked them up. Woo! Very cool. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anybody else? No, okay. So this is called Life Among the Debris by Janet Ruth Fallon. And it was again in the back of Book Magazine. People lose themselves in books all the time. That's supposed to mean they're so engaged that they lose track of time or forget to eat. But as a volunteer and former board member at my local library, I've seen the phrase take on new meaning. 
I discovered remarkable fragments of selves lost both in the return books and in the 25 to 500 books donated each day. People are revealed in astonishing, hinting ways by the things they leave behind. Unlike messages in a bottle, whose senders desperately long for an audience, the flotsam and jetsam tucked into books tell secrets never meant to be told. They are a keyhole. You can peek into closed curtain lives. And the rest of the piece is some examples. So, I just think that's so interesting because it's such a tiny little thing, and she wrote a whole piece about it. And um, she's really talking about, you know, the joys and limits of imagination, and deeper down, it's about traces and what we leave, and what others might find, and what others might think of us after we're gone, or at least after we've left the book. Okay, this is part six. I have advice for you. Take notes. Wherever you go, take notes. You can look up a lot on the internet, but not everything. And specifics can be golden. Write down what you see and hear. Write it down in a notebook, paper, or virtual. Don't write it on scraps of paper because you will lose them, unless you paste them onto your notebook pages, which is not a bad idea. I was awarded a fellowship from the Illinois Arts Council and went to Europe in 1992, gathering information for a novel. Uh, going to a conference, museums, people's apartments, cafes, theaters, taking trains, talking to people, taking pictures, not enough pictures. I'm still using some of the notes. I went to Frankfurt, Germany and saw the house where Anne Frank lived with her family until Hitler came to power. They were smart. They fled to Holland. Then you know what happened next. It took me a long time to put the piece together. I started with famous photos. I described them, but I didn't reproduce the photos because I thought it would cost too much. And I don't, it might or might not have, I don't know. Um, I didn't check. So the first little piece is photos, Anna, 1941, Margot, 1941. They both part their hair on the left side wear a watch on the same wrist, have the same eyebrows, same open-mouthed smile. Their noses and eyes are different, the shape of their faces, the cut of their hair, the fall of it. Books are open in front of each of them. One photo we glance past, because she is unknown, we don't care what she looks like, she's vaguely familiar, not the real one. She is the sister of, the shadow, the first child who made way for the second, the important one, who is more alive, whose photo is crisp in contrast, not blurry. And then I talked about what I read, that Anne Frank's sister, Margot, was considered the serious one, and she kept a journal. And I wondered what brave, strange, intelligent thoughts that she might have written down. And I speculated what she might have, might have written, because her, her journal was never found. And I gave an opinion about why we like Anna and Margot. Frank. They were suburban and then urban. They had bicycles and birthday parties. We know how to put both of those things together, or whom to call to arrange them. The girls were just like us, the thrill of the avalanche missed. Not that we would ever sacrifice someone else. I copied a list of French vocabulary words that I saw at the Anna Frank house in Amsterdam. I described the house in Frankfurt. I got inside Margot's head at the end. I sent the piece around and Creative Nonfiction Journal accepted it for publication. Then they called me. They were nervous. They thought that people would misunderstand. They wanted me to reassure them that it wasn't fiction. I said, I say perhaps. I say perhaps again. I say perhaps. Margot remembered. Perhaps Margot grieved. And Margot also didn't write. I used italics. I think that was my big point. If you use italics to cite people, then you have to give the reader the benefit of common sense. So, number seven. There is power in words. There is power in density. There is power in what you don't explain, but you take a risk. If you don't explain, the reader might not understand. So just in case, I will ask you, what does the verb to gaslight mean?
Nobody gets a reward. Okay. Um, it was a play. There was a play in 1938 by Patrick Hamilton in England. And um, when it came to the US, it was called Gaslight. And it was about a man who is trying to drive his wife crazy. Um, and she, she says, notices the gaslight, the, but they have the gaslit lamp, and she notices it, it, it like changes. It's like shadowy and then bright, shadowy and bright. And he's like, oh no, it's not changing at all. And it, it is that way because he's in another part of the house looking for some kind of treasure, and he's a really bad guy. So it, for a while, the, the American uh, film came out in 1944, so around that time, people thought about that, and they made it to a verb. Okay, so Adrian Rich, who was a younger, young teenager when the movie came out, uses the word, which is perfect for the second wave of feminism. Patriarchy has been trying to hoodwink us. We have been brainwashed to believe certain things about ourselves. And Rich, at a women's writers conference in 1971, puts together a talk about lying. She finishes it four years later. Her piece is called Women in Honor, Some Notes on Lying. And notice they're called notes. And this is an important form to remember, that you can write a finished piece in the form of notes, as long as it forms a complete work, as long as there's rhythm and movement among the pieces. She wrote that she wanted to break silence between women. She begins with a fragment. It's a good idea if you're going to have sentence fragments later that you start with them so that people will be used to them and not surprised later. And her essay begins, the old male idea of honor, a man's word sufficed to other men without guarantee. Our land free, our men honest, our women fruitful, a popular colonial toast in America. Male honor also having something to do with killing. I could not love thee dear so much, loved I not honor more from Lucasta of going to the wars. Male honor as something needing to be avenged, hence the duel. Women's honor something altogether else, virginity, chastity, fidelity to a husband. Honesty in women has not been considered important. We have been depicted as gen generically whimsical, deceitful, subtle, vacillating, and we have been rewarded for lying. Men have been expected to tell the truth about facts, not about feelings. They have not been expected to talk about feelings at all. Yet even about facts, they have continually lied. We assume that politicians are without honor. We read their statements trying to crack the code, the scandals of their politics. Not that men in high places lie, only that they do so with such indifference, so endlessly, still expecting to be believed. We are accustomed to the contempt inherent in the political lie. Um, another thing I want you to know, this is, I guess, number eight, that you can mix point of view in a piece. Um, and this is from um, I Will Send For You or I Will Come Home Rich by Richard Rodriguez. And he's talking about a universal experience that Mexican men go through not all, obviously, when they go up to the north and sneak into the country. And then he talks about him and his father, and then he talks about himself, and then he has history, so he just does a lot of um, different things. And it starts out in second person, which I like a lot. I know some people hate it, and they just won't read anything in second person. You stand around, you smoke, you spit, you are wearing two shirts, two pants, two underpants. Jesus says if they chase you, throw that bag down. Your plastic bag is your mama, all you have left. The yellow cheese she wrapped has formed a translucent rind. The laminated scapular of the sacred heart nestles, flame in its cleft. Put it in your pocket inside. Put it in your underneath pants pocket. The last hour of Mexico is twilight, the shuffling of feet. Jesus says they are able to see in the dark. They have x-rays and helicopters and searchlights. Jesus says, wait, just wait till he says. Though most of the men have started to move. You feel the hand of Jesus clamp your shoulder, fingers cold as ice. Venga, corre, you run. 
All the rest happens without words. Your feet are tearing dry grass. Your heart is lashed like a mare. You trip, you fall. You are now in the United States of America. You are a boy from a Mexican village. You have come into the country on your knees with your head down. You are a man. And there's white space. And white space can never be overestimated. It, it's a great, wonderful thing. Uh, also asterisk. Papa, what was it, it, Papa, what was it like? I am his second son, his favorite child, his confidant. After we have polished the DeSoto, we sit in the car and talk. I am 16 years old. I fiddle with the knobs of the radio. He is 50. He will never say he was an orphan there. He had no mother. He remembered none. He lived in a village by the ocean. He wanted books and had none. You are a lucky boy. And he wrote this to go with a series of photos. And this uh, I got from Mother Jones a long time ago. And you can see the photos. They're like Xeroxes of Xeroxes of photos. But it's also in a nonfiction collection of short pieces, which I think was put together just, you know, um, by thinking, okay, now what's the limit, the word limit? Let's just take some of these pieces and put them in there. And I'm not sure if he did it or the editor did it. Okay, there's also something else you can do. You can write about yourself and your family by focusing on an object. And this first paragraph is sort of cheating because the person is in there. And it's called From Here to Poland by Nina Meta. And what I'm going to do is give a bibliography to, um, to Beth, and I'm also going to have it online. And so if you want to, if you want to read the pieces or other pieces I recommend, you can find them. Once, quite a long time ago, there was a Dutch sideboard that crossed three oceans. It had been purchased in Frankfurt, Germany when I was two years old, and my sister had just been born. My parents must have been in love then, because they had defied both sets of parents to marry. Parents who worried that their respective child would wind up in the other one's country and would then, therefore, be lost to them. What the parents may or may not have known at the time was that both sets would eventually be proven right, but also that their children had already been lost to them before they met each other in an art store on East 53rd Street in mid-Manhattan, staring at a darkened arrangement of thin, erratic flowers in a painting by Oskar Kokoschka. So it really moves a lot in time. I mean, if you were, able, if you were to sit and look at that paragraph, it's like time and place is just moving. Um, you can mix the personal and the political. You can change diction and tone. Again, if you have white space, and tell the reader, OK, I'm changing. Um, this is a piece I really love by Michelle Cliff. And it's, it's called, If I Could Write This in Fire, I Would Write This in Fire. And she grew up in Jamaica. And this is, these are just a couple excerpts. They're goddamn kings and they're goddamn queens. Grandmotherly Victoria spreading herself thin across the globe. Elizabeth II on our TV screens. We stop what we are doing. We quiet down. We pay our respects. 1981, in Massachusetts, I get up at 5 a.m. to watch the royal wedding. I tell myself, maybe the IRA will intervene. And maybe at this point, some people don't know what the IRA is because they're not, there's been a truce. Anybody want to say what the IRA is in this context? <laughs> we have our subject of the Commonwealth, right? Yeah. And they were doing some, they were doing some terrorist activities in London. Okay, sorry, it's a, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's got to be, and also Bobby Sands was an IRA uh, member, and he starved himself to death in prison. Okay, I tell myself maybe the IRA will intervene. It's got to be better than starving themselves to death. Better to be a kamikaze in St. Paul's Cathedral than a hostage in Ulster. And last week, black and white people smashed storefronts all over the United Kingdom. But I really don't believe we'll see royal blood on TV. I watch because they once ruled us. In the back of the cathedral, a Maori woman sings an aria from Handel. And I notice that she is surrounded by the colored subjects. To those of us in the Commonwealth, the royal family was the perfect symbol, 
of hegemony, which is a word to learn in college. <laughs> to those of us who are dark in the dark nations, the prime minister, the parliament barely existed. We believed in royalty. We were convinced in this belief. Maybe it played on some ancestral memories of West Africa, where other kings and queens had been, altars and castles and magic. And she's personal, and then she goes, we, and sometimes you just, you really go out on a limb. To, she's speaking for all the colonials in the uh, British Commonwealth. But you can get away with that. Um, and I think we're not bold enough most of the time. Um, this is 10. I've been working on a book about the South, and um, in one part of it, I'm writing about an artist in Selma, Alabama, and he, is na he named himself the Tin Man, and it's because he had $10 in his pocket, and when they talk there, 10 is the same as, ten, as 10. Okay, like I, people on the East Coast, they say Mary, 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 you know, three different ways. This is in in Alabama, they say ten, ten the same way. And this is me, right? What is me and what is not me? The Tin Man drew and painted and made toys out of wire and cans and sticks as he was growing up. Worked odd jobs and worked maintenance at a hospital until he was laid off. Then he cut down and hauled logs and fell from the truck breaking his back. He was paralyzed from the waist down. He prayed. He prayed to God that he could be reborn, that he could create. And he told his friends that his life was changing. He promised God that he would give him credit, that he would teach others if he would be redeemed, and he was, which takes us back to the $10 in his pocket. He could use his arms and hands, and leaning over the side of the bed, he made animals out of wire. He painted. He felt God moving within him. He felt the duty to feel joy, though he does not say it that way. He is walking now. He had back surgery. He is thin and almost rangy, is always in pain, he says, but has discipline, which seems, I think, to mean listening to that voice within, allowing God to work through him. Discipline is something like hewing to the path that your special gift is carving out for you. There is the connection with the universal, though he doesn't use Latinate words like that. He dropped out of school in fourth grade. He shows me an envelope from Vermont, asks me to pronounce the name of the city, Brattleboro. Some students from there are coming to work with him. He works with students in school and at summer camp. They build funkified dinosaurs of yarn and wire and wooden leg joints. The connection from soul to soul is larger than voting rights, is larger than politics. He didn't get involved in them much. Though he remembers when JFK was shot, felt himself utterly changed by the assassination. Because he could see that the president could be felled. He could be killed for what he believed in. The world had changed. He is not bitter, does not hold anything against anyone. If he were to encounter a white supremacist, he would listen to him. He would smother him with love. He does not say this exactly. He would listen. And uh, I want you to think about the summer of 1991 and raise your hand if you were not alive then. Okay. <laughs> All right, I started a novel in the summer of 1991 and about six pieces of it have been published, but the whole, piece, the whole novel I just keep Rewriting and rewriting, it's been rejected and rejected. And I think it's because I write in little pieces and I don't have the kind of brain that can do a novel. So anyway, I've cannibalized some of it into essays. And this is one of them. And it's called The Wandering Womb. And the first part is called Hysterikos. The ancient Egyptian document known as the Cahun Papyrus, Cobra Papyrus, Papyrus, advises its readers that the cause of some female trouble is the wandering womb. Similarly, in the 4th century BCE, Hippocratic physicians wrote that women with certain symptoms could be plagued by a wander-lustful womb, which had loosened itself from its mysterious moorings to cause trouble in the parts of the body where it had set up shop. If the womb strayed into the head, it would cause headaches. If it sat in a woman's chest, 
It could cause near suffocation. A misplaced womb could steal breath, bind up a throat, make everything difficult. Give it a child and it will be happy. Sometimes treatment was performed via the orifices. Affected women would be given something foul smelling to breathe so that the womb would be repulsed, would hightail it back down where it belonged. Another treatment was to expose the vulva to something pleasant smelling to lure the womb down to its rightful place, the way a woman incites a lover with sweet perfumes. Intercourse was proposed as a cure. After all, the womb longed to be of use. It wanted to be a nest. In the age before dissection, men could not divide its mysteries. The womb, said Plato, is a wild animal. The womb, according to medical writer Arteus the Cappadocian, two centuries later, is like some animal inside an animal. Okay, this is it's maybe 13, I think it is. Anyway, I'm going to read a piece that is me, but not really me. I mean that the eye of the piece is not really me, and it's just like in the modest proposal by <laughs> the narrator is not really Jonathan Swift when he says I am here. So, um, okay, and, and Emma, you can keep passing out along while I'm reading. I love pink M&M's. I, love pink M &Ms. I eat them every day. <clears throat> If I eat enough of them, my cancer will go away, won't it? Isn't that what they promise? In the USA, we like our news and health and our donations sugar-coated. If I eat M&Ms and if I go on the Avon walk, do I get a free Avon makeover before setting out? All those cameras, you see, I must look my best. It's important to look my best. That's why we wear pink ribbon in our hair. And oops, not all of us have hair thin around our necks. And if I sell pink ribbon cupcakes and support the cause brownies, great for a bake sale or afternoon tea, the pink ribbon folks tell us, then I will be in the pink. The ingredients for support the cause brownies will make me healthy. If not, why would they be named after Susan G. Komen, who has a whole breast cancer foundation named after her? Oops, she's dead. She died of breast cancer. Maybe she died from eating these brownies. But how could that be? They're made with M&M's, milk chocolate candies, help fight breast cancer. Mixed with Snickers and brownie mix. Any brand, quick. Here's an opportunity for another multinational corporation to hop on the pink bandwagon. And a can of, your brand name here, chocolate frosting. What could be more natural for us girls? We're made of sugar and spice. Even our out of control cancer cells are nice because they're pink, like us, aren't they? Remember to follow the recipe. We have to learn to follow recipes to be good cancer patients. And don't forget the final decorations. Decorations are important. Make a continuous ring of M&M's brand milk chocolate candies help fight breast cancer around the bottom of the brownies. Celebrate. Or instead of baking, you could read a book like Pink Ribbons, Inc. Breast Cancer and the Politics of Philanthropy by Samantha King, which says, as the Komen Foundation and its corporate sponsors continue to pump money into a research and education agenda that centers on uncritically promoting mammography, encouraging the use of pharmaceuticals to prevent breast cancer, and avoiding any consideration of environmental links to the disease, it becomes less clear whether they are not, whether they are not actually doing more harm than good. And I have to say, I wrote this in maybe 07, and the Komen Foundation is doing more than just awareness now. They've, they've, gotten, they've gotten better. So I'm going to end there, and I want to disperse all the pink um, M&Ms. These are not officially breast cancer M&Ms. They're just pink M&Ms that I got at the store. Right. So do people have questions? Want yes, questions? Yes, questions. So comments? Okay. Ben Holocaust. You're all writers. Questions? Okay, she's good. She's good. <laughs> so, Title IX, Girls Got Sports Equality. Okay, you have a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Um, I was wondering if you talk more about being shy and being a journalist. How do you overcome that in interviews when you have to ask harder questions? Or I mean, you know, it's gotten easier over the years, but when I was in, I went to Northwestern for undergrad and I was in journalism, which was a separate school. There were like five different schools at Northwestern. And I couldn't, I hadn't been able to decide between English and journalism, and somebody told me before I got there, before I applied, that it's easier to move from journalism to English than from English to journalism, so start out in journalism. And there were times that I wanted to go to English, creative writing, because, you know, I would get up, I'd have to talk to somebody, if they were mean, it was horrible, you know? And I remember even when I was an intern in a newspaper, like somebody was really mean to me, and I, you know, on the phone, and I started crying. You know, it's like it, uh, but it gets it got better, and so um, it sort of. I guess sometimes journalism, but I had this curiosity that was really strong, and so I think the curiosity propelled me to go ahead and ask questions, even though the shyness got in the way. But it was hard, and I envy people who are just like naturally friendly and just naturally talk to people, you know. So, have you had a hard time <laughs> talking to people? Or? Well, I guess, yeah, I guess, you know, sometimes when I'm doing campus activities and newspaper stuff, it depends on the day, you know, so I find that it's, it's hard to keep that up all the time. I find myself being an actually a shy person, but yeah, the curiosity keeps me going also, so thank you. Yeah. yeah. And you know what I think now, I, but I think it is important to talk to people because I can't stand when, I'm going to offend people, I'm sure, but I, I don't like when I read an interview that was done over email because I think it, it puts a, the burden on the person who's being interviewed because they have to do a whole lot of work to make things, you know, to answer questions. And I think it's much better. Our, our program puts out tri-quarterly online, and I really encourage people to call the person and record it because you can ask follow-up questions and it's just more natural and you can edit it later and you can sound really stupid when you listen to yourself on the tape recorder and you go, oh my god, you sound like an idiot, but it doesn't matter because you're just transcribing it, you know, and you can edit it, so, any other questions? That was really wonderful. Thank you. I mean, this is such a Thank you. wonderfully sort of uh, well organized and interesting uh, look at pushing the bounds of creative nonfiction. And I was curious whether you ever hit points where you felt like you were pushing the boundaries too much. Were there moments where you vacillated and ultimately decided this was too fictional or too speculative or something like that? Huh. You know, what I just read about the Tin Man, I wondered if I was because I'm making judgments. Like, that this is what he, he says, even though he doesn't say it exactly. And then, then I was hoping I didn't sound, like, superior, because he couldn't pronounce Brattleboro, but my point was that, you know, people are writing to him from Vermont, and they want to work with him, and he can't even, I don't think, conceive of Vermont, but he's got this talent. So maybe making judgments. Yeah. Oh. Is, uh, is this something that would, that would be described by metafiction? So? I don't know. You know, it's like where's Coover when you want him, you know? Um, you know what? It's funny because like Robert Coover wrote the pub is it the public burning about Ethel and Julius Rosenberg and he wrote about Nixon. And I think You know, he, I think he go, he went further than I would go. I mean, he's really got Nixon saying all kinds of silly things and being a vaudevillian and stuff. Right, right, okay. um, I think that's metafiction, I mean. Uh, yeah, um, the example I had in mind was, the only time I've seen the term uh, used is by Tim O'Brien's uh, uh, finding the soap blasting, oh, uh, but it's sort of a fiction Uh, fiction and autobiographical. The things they carry? Oh, excuse me? The things they carry? I'm sorry? The things they carry? Is that what you're That's the 
But the, I mean that that was so interesting because I read that and I was like believing it the whole time, you know. But I don't know if I would call that not fiction. But what there is an, there is something by Philip Roth, and it's been classified as fiction and also nonfiction. And it's called Looking at Kafka. And the first part is biographical about Kafka. Do y'all know this? Anybody? And then the second half is he writes about himself as a boy in Newark, and they have this new teacher who came from overseas named Mr. Kafka. And like you just believe it, and you believe that Kafka lived and, and went to New Jersey after the war. And, and then they try to make to to, to uh, fix him up with Philip, um, Philip Roth's aunt, and something goes wrong. And it's like, I don't know, it's, I don't know what that is. It's sort of like trying to get people to believe in a fantasy. And I think if, if you write fiction, then you're going to call it fiction. If you write nonfiction, maybe call it nonfiction. Or, um, Philip Roth also wrote the book that I just couldn't read any more of because it made me too nervous about um, about the war, what if um, Lindbergh had won the presidency and the US becomes like Germany, sort of, in some ways. And that's called counter-historical. So, I mean, he could, if he wanted to make it nonfiction, he could have said, I wonder what would have happened if Lindbergh had won, perhaps, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know if you'd want to read a whole book that says that. It's something to talk about. Yeah. Can you talk about how um, cancer bitch has been received, especially in the illness community? Um, Generally, I think people, you know, what surprised me is some people who have different illnesses has, have said that it helped them. And I didn't write it to help anybody except me. You know, because I, you know, and I think a lot of times if you have like that kind of agenda that I'm going to help people, it might not, you know, come out as sincere. Um, but, you know, the title <coughs> gave me some problems like my stepdaughter's mother-in-law had breast cancer, but they didn't want to send her the book because she's very religious and would be offended just for the title. You know, so, uh, and we could go. All of us could talk on and on about titles. I'm sure titles that we were glad we had, titles that we didn't wish we hadn't had, book covers. But the publishers. Can you yeah. mention how you pick the projects that you decide to write about? Do you have like an idea book on Facebook, or do you? Yeah, you know, I have ideas on a file, but I don't think I look at them. But you know, some of it is just opportunistic. Like, I, the Illinois Arts Council like was running out of money. I just, as most arts councils are, and a few years ago they said we'll give people money for projects not just like, here's somebody, do whatever you want. And so I thought, okay, I've always wanted to go to Mississippi where my father's from and Alabama where my grandmother grew up. And so I just made up this thing, you know, I just said, you know, all you had to do was like find out how much a rental car would cost and find, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I said what I would do and, and I got the money and so I did it. And then I thought, oh, this is really interesting. So I just kept researching. And right now it seemed too big to me because I'm feeling I need to say things about the South and I keep reminding myself it's, it's called, I think, um, Moments in Selma and other pieces of the South that I'm just talking about places my family lived just to arbitrarily um, live in it. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the pros and cons in your writing, um, in writing in the second person? Hmm. 
You know, in Cancer Bitch, I used a bunch of different points of view. Sometimes I would speak of myself in the third person, like, Cancer Bitch thinks that blah, blah, blah. And I think I probably used second person, I used first person, and then maybe close first person, far away first person, different ones. And I just think that sometimes if I can't write something and I'm trying to get myself to write it, I just keep playing around with point of view until one of them seems right. And I'll go, maybe I'll try second person and it'll work. But I know people, especially, I worked at the Miami Herald, people just over, the whole newsroom, I think, hated second person. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was your experience here. A lot of people just don't like it. Or Bright Lights, Big City. I don't know if y'all know that novel. I liked it. It's all second person. What do you think of it? Um, I don't know. I, I ask because I don't have much experience with it. And I know the beginning novel, I heard of it, but I've never read it. But my experience was that in my writing, I just wanted to sort of gain different perspectives. I think it's something to try if you <coughs> just feel a little stuck. It might be easier. And then you could always convert it back if you wanted. Well, good. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.